Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and we're going to explore a, a topic again, I talk all the time about this vitamin D issue, but coming from a completely different uh, perspective. And I'll start by saying that people still think supplements are safe and the mistaken um, assumption is based on things like the product is natural and the worst case scenario is wasting money if they're ineffective, but the assumptions are incorrect and uh, many supplements, particularly vitamins, uh, are not natural, they're synthetically manufactured, so they have a chemical structure that looks just like vitamins, but they're not actually the vitamins that you would eat in food and a growing body of evidence says that these are harmful. Now, vitamin D, let's come back to this, vitamin D doesn't come in food. It's a hormone produced by the body in response to sunlight. So there's nothing natural about taking it in orally. But here's the study I wanna talk about that I think um, should make everybody very cautious about vitamin D. Um, in this study, researchers randomly assigned 29 subjects who had impaired glucose tolerance to take either 20,000 international units of vitamin D a week or a placebo. And then the subjects were followed for three to five years. Now at the end of the study period, they used needle biopsy to get samples of subcutaneous abdominal fat. And then they also got um, serum uh, blood tests to look at vitamin D levels in the blood. Um, for the people taking the vitamin D supplements, their serum vitamin D levels were an average of 99. People taking placebo, 62. So it's interesting, the people taking placebo, their vitamin D levels went up too. Maybe they got out in the sunlight, I don't know. Crazy idea, I know, but that's really the way to do it. Their fat, uh, the vitamin D stored in the fat was 209 nanograms as opposed to 32 uh, for the people taking placebo. The researchers concluded that if an equal amount of vitamin D was stored in the adipose tissue throughout the body, those taking vitamin D supplements had medium body fat stores of 264,000 international units of vitamin D. Now, while taking vitamin D increased blood levels by 62%, it increased the concentration of vitamin D in the fat tissue by 553%. And let's go back to the amount of vitamin D that was used, 20,000 international units a week, that's less than 3,000 per day, which is lots of people take far more than that on a daily basis. And by the way, vitamin D intake orally is likely to go up a lot when the new rules for labeling become uh, take effect and vitamin D is listed on the label. This is gonna incentivize more food manufacturers to fortify more foods with vitamin D. Researchers concluded that large amounts of vitamin D can be stored in the fat tissue and that the clinical significance of this finding is unknown. But it is quite possible that vitamin D toxicity could, occur, could accrue over time or occur at a time without any warning as the fat levels of vitamin D continue to increase. What is for sure is that serum vitamin D, blood tests for vitamin D, do not indicate how much vitamin D is stored in the body. So we might well be looking at the wrong marker. Now I said in the beginning, vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone produced in response to sunlight. The current enthusiasm for vitamin D supplementation, which should be hormone D supplementation, to me, is eerily similar to the enthusiasm for hormone replacement ther therapy for women who are experiencing unpleasant menopausal symptoms. Um, doctors, without much evidence, the same thing going on here, doctors were very enthusiastic about uh, prescribing uh, hormone replacement therapy to women. And it wasn't until years later that studies started to show that this was not a good idea, but by then a lot of women had been harmed. Some actually died from it. So we don't know what the long-term consequences of all this vitamin D supplementation are. And um, my gosh, I hope at some point in time the medical profession starts to get a little more cautious about, um, about the things that they do. And along that line, I have to say this. People sometimes say to me, you know, Dr. Pam, you're so radical. Really? I think I'm the conservative one. I'm saying we shouldn't be doing all this stuff. I think the people that are radical are the ones that are ready to jump off the cliff and do almost anything to anybody without really waiting for enough evidence to show that it's a good idea. All right, speaking of evidence showing it's a good idea, 
the number of bariatric surgeries is increasing and one of the biggest concerns I think all of us have is the number of children and adolescents who are having the surgery. Um, I've always thought that the surgery was risky and inadvisable but I think it's ridiculous to be talking to middle school kids about having it. Now the procedure almost always results in weight loss in the beginning but now we have more and more long-term data to look at to see if it really changes much in the long term. Laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy involves reducing the size of the stomach in order to limit the amount of food that somebody can eat. The surgery takes about two hours and involves making five to six incisions in the abdomen and then 75% of the stomach is removed which leaves a narrow gastric tube called the sleeve. The procedure doesn't decrease nutrient absorption since it doesn't affect or involve the intestines and the reduced size of the stomach results in fullness with eating a very small amount of food. One of the reasons the procedure is popular is that it's much less invasive than other forms of bariatric surgery and it's particularly um, considered a good option when you're operating on kids. Bad idea for a lot of reasons, but in any case. Research group in Israel looked at data for 443 patients who underwent the procedure. And um, in the short term, the, the surgery was successful. During the first year, patients lost an average of 76.8 pounds of their excess weight, and over half of them experienced remission from type 2 diabetes. But in the longer term, not so good. Five years after surgery, there were data available on fewer patients, but for those who were tracked, the patients had all regained weight, and all, only 20% were still in remission from type 2 diabetes. The remission from hypertension remained stable, cholesterol was insignificant, but the bottom line is that people gained the weight back and um, they ate their way back into type 2 diabetes. Now, this goes to what happens when you address the symptom of something and not the cause. People gain weight because they eat for the wrong reasons, because they don't know how to eat, because all kinds of things. The surgery doesn't change any of that, and those sleeves can be expanded by overeating, and so people end up with the same size stomach they had before, which means weight loss recurs, disease recurs, the surgery just postpones the inevitable necessity of dealing with the cause. So I think that patients should be told about this. When people ask me about bariatric surgery, I have several articles in the Health Briefs Library um, about this issue, and I tell them if, you, if you're going to do it, you should know some things about it. First of all, it's risky. Um, this one less than many other types, but um, it doesn't solve the problem. And if you really want to solve the problem, would you rather solve it now or would you rather have surgery and solve it 10 years from now? And the vast majority of people, when it's put to them that way, they really rather get rid of it now. So. That's all for today and for the week, actually. So pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Tuesday with more news.